All right, so welcome to class, everyone. Previously, we have talked, and Maggie's going to stop talking. And all of you guys are going to stop talking. Okay, we have talked about KSP, and we introduced the last type of KSP problem, which was kind of a bit of a doozy, all right, where you had to deal with dilutions, and you had to deal with double displacement reactions, first identifying the solid that is going to be uh, undergoing uh, equilibrium dissociation. And then, of course, you had to do some estimation where you assumed uh, with common ion problems, common ion solvent, where you assume that the contribution of the dissociating compound is negligibly contributing to the change in the concentration of that shared ion. And then we talked a little bit in a similar manner about how pH stops how pH affects solubility and can shift the equal, the crinkle, the crinkle, uh, how pH can affect solubility, okay? And we talked pretty conceptually about it. There wasn't real math with this one. You could do real math. Uh, when it comes to MCQ questions, it tends to be quite conceptual. Um, so then I left it with, okay, how would you apply pH solubility conceptually to an acidic sample with an original pH of three, and now we stick it in a solution that is either more basic or more acidic, okay? So what did you say for uh, part A for two, acidic sample H plus producing? You have a pH of originally three, all right? And then what you have is I stick it in a sample that's more acidic, which is like adding more H. Thank you. What's going to happen to our solubility and therefore equilibrium? It's going to shift which direction? So the solubility is going to go down and it's going to shift not left, but what's the term, better term? Because I get my left and rights mixed up really bad. So, huh? Forwards? Forwards? Reverse toward the reactants if your solubility is less. So what we say is we shift toward... Reactants and Kai, did you take chemistry ever? Uh, oh, sophomore year. No, then not really. So no, that doesn't count. So uh, what about more basic? More basic. If I put my acidic sample, acidic ionic compound that's going to dissociate, releasing H plus ion into a more basic OH containing, okay, solvent. What is going to happen to my uh, solubility? Huh? It's going to go up because what we're doing is we're going to remove H plus with the neutralization reaction of OH minus and H plus, right? An acid plus a base. And it's going to shift toward product, increasing the solubility. Okay. So that kind of wraps up K. That wraps up K uh, regarding ion concentration and other factors. But now I'm gonna introduce to you two other characteristics or functions in which we examine thermodynamically, whether a reaction is favorable or unfavorable and particularly which direction in equilibrium is the spontaneous favorable direction. So first and foremost, I'm gonna introduce the role of entropy with equilibrium, then the role of enthalpy with equilibrium, and then we will summarize with Gibbs free energy, the quantitative value that we give to thermodynamic calculations. Okay, that's a summation of all of these factors. So entropy, okay, entropy. Um, uh, oh, I guess I wanted you guys to first review factors that affect solubility of an ionic compound. So uh, concentration, because of KSP and temp, right? Think KSP, solubility product constant. You also know that Q versus K can help you determine the solubility of an ionic compound. You also know the common ion effect can decrease solubility, right? This is kind of just like a nice summary. And then of course, pH, okay? So that being said, that's kind of where we left off in our previous day and a half discussion. And now let's look at, well, where does entropy fit into all of this? So entropy is uh, the state of disorganization for a system of substance. It's the state of disorganization. Yeah, the state of disorganization for a system or substance. 
Okay. So um, the symbol for entropy is capital S. Um, <laughs> okay, I won't say that. Never mind. I was gonna make a funny joke, but I don't think it's appropriate. So, okay, so it's AKA <laughs> a measure of randomness. So molar entropy is a value that we can tabularize because it's now standardized. <laughs> Gee, well, curves. And the units are joules per moles times Kelvin. So it is a extrinsic value that is dependent on amount. It is tabularized and it is usually taken under certain conditions, standard state. So what you're going to see is we're probably going to be able to do summation of entropy calculations very soon. Okay. The more organized something is, the more organized, okay, the more ordered, the less random it is, therefore the less entropy. And that is a capital S entropy. If you do little s, it's seconds, okay? Um, the more random, it would be the opposite. So the more random something is, okay, the more entropy it has. Another terminology that we use instead of saying randomness or disorganization is we say that the more microstates you have or the possible configurations of a system, okay? It means if you have more microstates, you also have more entropy. That's kind of the fancier way of saying it. So entropy and change in states of matter. Obviously, entropy is going to increase as you go to more disorganized states of matter. So the entropy of a solid is less than the entropy of a liquid, which is less than the entropy of a gas. No dir. Okay, entropy and complexity of a particle. The entropy of a simple particle, such as H2, is less than, oh, uh-uh, uh, sorry, 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 sorry. It's not less than. It is, oh, actually, no, 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 well, oh. yeah, simple particle, okay, is less than the uh, entropy of a complex particle, such as like C2H4OH, okay? Um, here's why. It takes, there's more ways that you could technically configure the atoms to make the complex particle. So this is more entropy of formation, I should really put. This is more having to do with entropy of formation. So the entropy and complexity of a particle, uh, and this isn't considering when forming, from the perspective of forming the particle. Now, obviously, once the particle has been made, the entropy of the particle now made as that's more complex is actually lower. And the entropy of a simpler particle once made is uh, technically, I don't know if I want to say higher. I think I'd rather just leave it at the end of once it's been formed, it's lower entropy, but in the process of forming a more complex molecule, you have higher entropy. So we could make like that entropy change up and we make one for entropy as well? Yes, you do. You can technically do that. So entropy changes in reactions involving gases, okay? So obviously we know that gases have uh, the highest uh, entropy value compared to, compared to solid and liquid, right? So generally speaking then, any gas containing reaction is gonna have an overall higher entropy value most likely, okay? Most likely. Um, so what we say is that when we have gas particles, okay, Uh, that combine into fewer particles, i.e. less moles. For example, 4A goes to like 2B. What you see is your entropy decreases. Your entropy of reaction will decrease. But if you have a gas particle reaction where they decompose, okay, or form more particles, For example, 2B goes to 4A, the exact opposite. You will see entropy of the reaction 
increase. There's more microstates. There's more possible configurations that can occur. Hate it. So if you were to add heat to a system, uh, the entropy would increase, right? Yes. Okay. So microstates are based off of the amount of particles you have and not... The amount of configurations, which is usually uh, connected to the amount of particles. Like the amount, like the different... Combinations of all combinations, things. placement. It could be configuration in terms of bonding. It could be configurations in space. Uh, next was a loc, I think. Um, I had a very similar question about the microstates. Oh, okay. Um, as in regards to like states, are visible states of microstates and then positionalized? Yes. Well, you, when you're a gas, you're moving at much higher kinetic energy, so your your position in the universe is not as contained and and like locked in. As a configuration in space. So, Li the Liam. I should probably split this into 2A and 2C. That would probably make more sense. No, no, but so still wouldn't you replace B so you have more uh more atoms per molecule as you have more complex molecules? But once you form the molecule, the molecule now carries a lower entropy that's complex. It's the process of forming that's increased. Okay, so there's two separate ideas. Yes, which is the unfortunate part about this subtopic. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sure, because they have they're a microstate. They are a possible configuration in space. So what about if the solid is like a crystal? They, they are still vibrating, so there's still motion. Mm -hmm. So there's still a microstate. It's just that that microstate, the entropy would be nearly zero. But to have true entropy, you have to have it's you it the, yeah. yeah uh, zero Kelvin. Zero Kelvin. Essentially, uh there are there might be a structure. I don't know. There's technically, yeah, there's technically some movement. So there's a different, slight different configuration it can have. But for the most part, when you talk about lattice structures and things like that, it, we would essentially treat it as basically zero. But like a powder would have higher. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So to clarify, Is higher entropy. Is, is what gives it its, uh, its uh, like the, the amount of different variables you've added creating the compound. When you look at entropy, yes. When you look at entropy, because remember, the pathway of creating compound is all about collision. Yeah. Hitting in the right position with the right energy, right? So if you're looking at entropy through the process of forming a compound, the more complex it is, the more possible incorrect configurations you could make depending on your collision. But once you've locked in the, so the, the compound, now you say that the entropy of that compound once made is low because it is now locked in and it is, it is um, yeah, I guess you could say it, it's more complex once made. Can, okay, I can only take about one more question or we're not gonna finish this content. Okay, Sky. Um, so adding heat to carbon increasing the entropy like Theoretically, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. And theoretically, you would eventually probably transition, you're building transition up to a different state, which is definitely going to be a greater entropy. So we're going to see how we're not going to get super into entropy calculation wise too much until later units, unit nine, but you're going to get a small slice into how we get calculations here. What did you want to say, Keaton? Right, so micro, thank you. Microstates is just a piece of terminology that you might see on a public testing. What are we all watching Kyle do? Okay, so let's look at an example here. In the synthesis of water from its elements, entropy decreases as three gas molecules are organized into two. You see the value, okay? This is your entropy values for the reactants. This is your entropy value for the products. Okay, you'll see that entropy is less 
in the product configure configuration than it is in the sum reactant configuration. No more questions. We're not going to make it through. Okay. Solids typically decompose by releasing a gas. Entropy increases in the following example. So this is the opposite, where you see your solid reactant has a less has less entropy than the sum total of the entropy of your uh, uh, produced solid and gas products. Okay. So chemical changes uh, when mole amounts don't change from reaction to pro reactant to product. Now, we've already dealt with this concept that the mole change is important with Le Chatelier's principle, understanding the effect of change in pressure and volume for a gas-based reaction. We've already dealt with the similar idea that you need to have a variance in moles amount of particles, okay? But with entropy, what this means is that, okay, um, if you have where N of R, so the moles of reactant is equal to the moles of product, right? And here again, N is equal to mole amount. Okay, what we see is that entropy for the reaction will decrease when similar atoms group together. So you don't have number of particles now now you have to look at the actual structure that you're building when similar atoms group together it's more entropic entropically favorable okay to get together okay uh entropy increases for a reaction okay when uh, similar atoms are split Did I reverse them? When entropy, when similar atoms group together. Is it a decrease in entropy? Or is it yeah, it's a, it's, you have less you have less it would be less entropy. It wouldn't be favorable. Sorry guys, I reversed that. Okay, trust my writing. Sometimes my audio doesn't always match. Okay, so, sorry guys, I get my ups and downs and lefts and rights really mixed up. So, um, when you, Similar atoms, okay, split into more complex. There's also literally an example like right over here with numbers. Split into more complex, okay, um, compounds. What you see is entropy increases. So uh, here, uh, when similar atoms already in a bond together split into four more complex compounds, you'll see that the entropy increases. So here's your example for this one. Here's your example for this one. And this is only in the case when moles don't change between reactant and product. It's a kind of a special subcategory. Well, yeah, but uh, the atoms in the molecule, sorry, that's what it means. It's like similar atoms that make up a molecule. So like a diatomic or of the same column or something like that. Okay, when they're split, and they're put into a new, more complex molecule, okay? The way that they're rearranged, you'll see that entropy increases. And this particularly is true for when your moles of reactant equal your moles of product particles. Here is my little Both encouragement to you. Huh? Both of your examples have an increase of entropy. Both of those are examples of and I think both examples of the second. I was trying to I see a note on my thing now that I said you should look at this problem reversed. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Oh yeah. I was saying look at the problem reverse. Okay, there we go. If you draw the arrow this way and say if you're looking at the reaction the other way, uh you see that it affirmed both of these. If you look at the reaction the other way, you see the first affirmed. And if you look at the reaction going forward, you see the forward affirmed, okay? Yeah, we should just move on because honestly, this is like quizzed barely on the AP. It's like very easy, obvious questions on the MCQ, okay? Just entropy in general. 
entropy in general, as long basically, if you see it get more disordered, increase in entropy. And or they'll give you actual physical calculations that will affirm whether you are increasing or decreasing entropy in a process. Like they will just give it to you. Okay. So despite the following, we're not, we're just going to move on past this. This is unimportant. Let's look at practice problems. Try doing the following practice problems. Really basic. Just go for it. Tell me increase in entropy or decrease in entropy. Try it out for a minute. So first one, increase or decrease in entropy. Excellent. Here's why. Because you're going from the pure solid to solid gas. Mm, I see that G looks like an S that had problems. Oh, there you go. Okay. I know, right? Okay. How about the next one? Decrease. Looks like you were right. Because you go from nine moles of reactant to eight moles of reactant. Three, increase or decrease? decrease? Excellent. See, this is the level of MCQ right here. This is the level of AP MCQ question. Uh, otherwise, they would, or they might have you actually calculate entropy. Again, you would be given the data, or you would at least be given enough that you could figure out all the data, okay? So um, how does entropy explain dissociation? How does it explain the role, uh, the likelihood of an ionic compound dissociating in an equilibrium process in a solution, specifically water. So what we see here is when you're talking about dissociation, one, remember that first step is that the solvent, solvent IMFs have to break. And you're of course solute, solute are breaking. The solute, solute bonds because this is an actual ionic compound break. So what you get is an overall process of increase in entropy for this particular step. Then two, what happens is you form solute solvent, ion dipole attractions. Remember that word? Which is a decrease in entropy. So therefore, the sum of your entropy Okay, the sum of your entropy for this dissociation of your system is going to be equal to the sum of the entropy involved for the respective solvent, solvent, and solute, solute breaking, and then solvent, solute forming. You'd have to be given values to know that. But what the idea is that entropy is going to dictate whether a specific ionic compound is high solubility or low solubility. So obviously, if you are a high solubility dissociated ionic compound, you probably have a really high positive entropy, which means the value of entropy from step one is greater than the value of the entropy lost in step two, right? So, uh, and I can summarize that really quickly with just a quick note that the more positive your entropy is, right, for a reaction, the uh, more probably soluble, right, the more favorable dissociation is, because the universe loves to increase entropy, the universe loves to be more chaotic, look at your rooms after two hours of being in them, look at this room after one period, right, so look at your life. So, <laughs> sorry. Are you sorry? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. So, for everyone watching at home, I have everyone watching at home. To be fair, I've lived longer than you guys, so my life is much more in chaos than yours. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so enthalpy now. Let's talk about the role of heat enthalpy, what we already studied in unit six. How does it play a part in the equilibrium and the dissociation process? So um, here's an image of enthalpy, okay, uh, and the process of dissociation. What you need to remember is this. One, when you are, and I'm actually just gonna copy and paste up here. We're gonna repeat the kind of description that was represented up here, down below, but with enthalpy now. Copy, 
pace. So now what you see is when I consider enthalpy for dissociation, if I'm breaking IMFs, I am adding energy, enthalpy. I am intaking, absorbing enthalpy and using it, latent heat of fusion, latent heat of vaporization to break up the IMFs. I think it's a good thing that the tennis boys did not go to play. Um, so, but when I am forming, when I am forming ion dipole attractions, it should be theoretically more stabilizing. So I should have a negative H. Why are we all talking? So the enthalpy of the dissociation is going to be the sum of the enthalpy of this process. Again, it is going to be unique. Now, the universe favors exothermic reaction. So what we would say is, if you have a negative H value for this dissociation, oh gee willikers, a negative H value for this dissociation overall, okay, that is a more favorable process and specifically more, okay, dissociation is occurring. So now what we do is we put these two factors together, okay? And we say, okay, we can describe and predict dissociation from the KSP values, but we also can describe and predict dissociation and the position of equilibrium in which direction it favors from considering the entropy and the enthalpy required in the system. So what we say is this together is described the relationship the interplay between enthalpy and entropy is described in, an, in a term called Gibbs free energy. Now, Gibbs free energy is defined as the energy available to do work, particularly in physics, available to, we are having a physics shout out right now, but it's That's technically funny. not real energy. How do I spell technically? Hold on. Technically, whoa, that doesn't look right. That's not a cue. <laughs> technically, okay, not real energy because it's not conserved. So, because it's not conserved. So, when we talk about Gibbs free energy in chemistry, what we care about it is not the actual concept of energy itself. It's that we can use Gibbs free energy to relate enthalpy of a system, entropy of a system, and temperature of a system to explain. This is actually why we use it, to explain um, the equilibrium of a reversible reaction, okay? The favorability of a reversible reaction. Um, yeah. Gib, yeah. have you ever seen iCarly? Gibby. Oh, okay. Have you seen iCarly? Yeah, I grew up with iCarly. Oh yeah, because you're like, what is that? Yes, I know. Okay, that was a good thing. So, um, gibbs Hempholtz equation is the equation that we use to represent this mathematical relationship. And gibbs Hempholtz equation is that the change in G for a reaction is equal to the change in enthalpy minus temperature times the change in entropy for the system that you're describing. Where we have Gibbs of G is in measured in joules, uh, H is also measured in joules, not kilojoules, but joules. So you might have to do conversion. T is measured in Kelvin. And S is measured in joules per Kelvin. Okay. Um, quick note, when you look at enthalpy values in the table, it's measured as kilojoules per mole. So you often are going to be required to convert um, enthalpy values to joules. Just keep that in mind when you're doing calculations with Gibbs free energy is usually your enthalpy value has to be um, changed in units because tabularized enthalpy is in kilojoules, but everything here is in joules. 
Okay, so um, the thermodynamic. Uh, so my students use all my equipment and I'm now a personal charging station for students. Okay, so thermodynamic, okay, or the thermodynamic favorability or the Gibbs free energy, they're pretty much interchangeable because Gibbs free energy does represent thermodynamic, okay, quantity, okay, influences the equilibrium and helps us actually indicate the equilibrium position of a given reversible reaction. So what we say is, if we have a reaction that is driven toward decreasing enthalpy, okay, what we say then is that what's favored is, oh, gee, well, it occurs not in hot pink. What we are saying is that it is, the reaction is driven in favor of the negative H direction, the direction that has a negative enthalpy, exothermic direction. So that means um, that, Favored negative H direction, i.e. the exothermic direction is always favored by the universe. Universe. Always favored. That's a G. Okay, you'll, still you'll get used to my G's. That really doesn't look like an my mom taught me how to write these. No, so don't. <laughs> okay. So if we say that thermodynamically, we're driven toward increasing entropy. The reason that something's favorable is because the entropy is super high. What we would say is that we are favoring, okay, positive change in entropy. The universe loves chaos. So what we're going to do is we're always going to favor the direction. So the direction okay, that has an overall increase in entropy is preferable. So, so that could be forward or reverse. Um, we don't have like a technical term for this. Like there's not like another word like exothermic for increasing entropy is not like that. We just say increasing entropy direction or greater entropy direction, more entropically favorable, okay? So those are kind of the two things that we consider is that thermodynamically, we want to maximize exothermic heat loss stabilization. And we want to also maximize chaos, okay? We love, hi, I miss you. We um, love chaos, which is right now my room. So um, what we say though, is sometimes these compete depending on the system that you're looking at, you can have it where you have an endothermic reaction with the high entropy, or you can have an exothermic reaction with the low entropy. And what we say is, is if that they compete with one another, all right? That is where you use the gibb hemholtz equation. Okay, to determine overall is my reaction thermodynamically favorable. You, hey, you missed my G's? You came just at the right time. I remember that was a big deal for you guys. They're my dynamically favorable. Finn was a student from last semester, right? How long have I had you? I taught you two years in a row. I know, and I wrote your recommendation letter. And I'm so really curious how long I'm here. Okay. So um, to be thermodynamically favorable means that you are preferred by the universe. And particularly, you are a negative G, okay, value. And therefore, you are the universe's preferred K okay, result. Preferred. Did I misspell preferred? Preferred. Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, man. Preferred. You know, I'm going to be hanging out with Miss Kreeshock a lot. So maybe next year. Oh, it's all right. You have better problems, Kreeshock. Yeah, Kreeshock actually can't do it. Okay. Hey, hey. Kreeshock is my hero. Yes. It's a greater positive change. That's a positive. That's a plus sign. Yeah. So 
Yeah, so what you do is you form the system, whichever direction you're comparing the values of reactant to product, whichever direction produces a change that's more positive, like the end result has a net gain of entropy, is favored. No, you could be positive and more positive. Well, it's, the idea is like you're less, one side's going to be less or greater than the other side. That's the better idea. It doesn't have to be negative. It just has to be more or less. The change from reactant to product, respectively, has to be more to be thermodynamically favorable. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, by the way, yes. Why do we care whether or not something is thermodynamic? Or thermodynamic? Because that tells us now, perfect lead in. That tells us, is it a spontaneous process? So, if you are thermodynamically favorable, okay you are spontaneously going to occur, which is really good to know because you sometimes want to know if you're going to spontaneously combust, if you are going to spontaneously crystallize, which would be very unlikely. If you are going to spontaneously fall into blah, 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 new product. Okay, so being spontaneous is a very important thing to recognize. And the technical definition of being spontaneous is it occurs without external intervention. I highly doubt so. Oh, probably not, but I don't watch Star Wars. I only watch Star Trek with Chris Pine because Chris Pine is the plot. Chris Pine is the plot. I would marry that man any day. <laughs> so give up all my, all my morale and just be like, yep, you're wonderful. That's fine. Did it ditch all of the other criteria? Ditch all of the other criteria. If you're Chris Pine, if you're Chris Pine, Chris Hemsworth, really any of the Chris's, really fine. Um, <laughs> probably not that one. <laughs> so I don't even watch animations like that. I don't watch South Park or anything like that. So I don't watch sitcom. Um, so quick note, this is really common MCQ right here. It's a trick question. Spontane spontaneity does not correlate with rate of reaction. We say that you could have a very slow, spontaneous reaction. We call that reaction under kinetic control. So it will happen. The universe will make it happen, but the, it's not going to make it happen immediately. It'll happen over time. Okay. So it's not spontaneous? Because spontaneous has nothing to do with rate. It has everything to do with do you need outside intervention? And the answer is no. So the decision to do the thing is spontaneous. This decision the of the universe. The universe, the universe oh, okay. says this is approved. This will happen. How fast it will happen? Not my problem, says the universe. Okay. That's yours to figure out. Yes. I really want to drink my tea. You can have a spontaneous reaction with a super high activation energy that is under kinetic control. Absolutely, that is exactly correct. Yes. So, go ahead, Leo. So polite. Why is that the energy? I mean, like, where is that energy coming from? The energy is coming from the arrangement of the particles in space. <laughs> <laughs> okay so summary if your g is less than zero i.e you have a negative g okay if your g is less than zero you are favorable in that particular direction because remember, we're talking about in terms of equilibrium. You are favorable in that particular direction of a reversible reaction. Um, and you would say that you are spontaneous in that direction. We call this, by the way, exergonic. Whichever direction is going to result in a negative G. 
So when you're talking about a reversible reaction, if the reverse has a negative G value and the forward has a positive G value, the reverse will be more spontaneous, more favored. The equilibrium position will be toward the reverse. And we call this exergonic equation. An exergonic equation is a thermodynamically favorable spontaneous reaction. If your G is equal to zero, your system is at equilibrium. And this is the winner right here. Your system is at equilibrium, okay? Um, and what we would say is there is no preferred direction, no favored direction, backwards or forwards. You've reached stability. Rate of forward is equal to rate of reverse. Finally, if the G is greater than zero, positive change in G for the system, the reaction is, or I should put it this way, the reaction in this particular direction is unfavorable, unfavorable, oh, and um, not spontaneous, we have a specific terminology. We call that endergonic. So if I'm an endergonic reaction, I am a positive G reaction in that particular direction of processing that is unfavorable and not spontaneous. And it could be unfavorable because it is entrop entropically more unfavorable than it is enthalpically favorable, right? The way between the relationship between H and S. But the G is the sum total of that relationship, okay? So that is the end of unit seven. You will be quizzed with a long FRQ worth 10 points, okay, on the FRQ midterm, okay, Thursday, 2023. And this grade will go into, all of unit seven grades will go into, including the homework check post spring break, will go into term four. I am only grading term, uh, sorry, units one through six for term three. Okie dokie, artichokies, good job.